Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Anxious though they were to return to Babylon, some of those in the house of Israel and Judah might have muttered, what, another covenant? Haven't we had enough covenants? It was, of course, the Israelites and the Jews who had broken those covenants, forever seeking new gods and abandoning the law. It was not a Babylonian bystander might have said a new covenant that was needed, but better adherence to the existing one. Nevertheless, Jeremiah insists that the new covenant will be different because the law will be within them, written upon their hearts. What could it mean to have a law or anything written on one's heart? Well, we're told it, that it will mean that no longer shall each man teach his neighbor. So what is written on the heart will be something that is innate, something that we shall know by instinct without needing to learn it, not from our parents, not from social intercourse, not from teachers or books. It'll be based in some elemental feeling or awareness, something essential to our humanity. The passage which follows our reading from Je Jeremiah suggests to me something of the nature of this essential awareness. Jeremiah goes on to describe God the creator, who gives the sun for light by day and the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. So our existence is dependent on the order of creation. We are totally reliant on God, our creator. And our response to this realization, the consequence of this understanding, should be a profound and all-pervading gratitude. Thanks that we are simply alive and live in an infinitely complicated and beautiful world. That we are each unique creatures set among so many others. As Jan suggested in her Ash Wednesday sermon at the beginning of Lent, gratitude should be the basis on which we build a closer relationship with God. It will be the motivation behind our efforts to love one another and behind our shame at not having done all we might do to advance that love in the world. And it'll be behind our resolve to do better. This isn't a gratitude that ignores the pain in the world. On the contrary, it inspires the love that can do something about that pain. For John, in, the, in his gospel, this world is almost, almost irredeemably corrupt. We needn't perhaps take literally Jesus' injunction that we must hate the world. Such hyperbole was apparently typical of Aramaic. Well, maybe so, but there's still a good deal of hostility to the physical world in both John's gospel and Paul's letters. So it might seem a bit strange that God should have wanted to join this, in, become incarnate in this world, if it was so bad. But of course, we're told that God so loved the world that he gave his only son to save it and change it. And he does so not so much by rejecting as submitting to its worst forces. As we enter Passion Tide, it's worth remembering that the passion is the passive suffering, the allowing and the submission of Jesus to all that the world throws at him. It was a submission with a purpose. The glorification of Christ on the cross makes possible the resurrection and the recreation of the world. This new or recreation is, I think, the eternal life which Jesus promises as another final covenant. He promises it to those who will give up love of this world and with him cast out the ruler of this corrupt world, marred and distorted by human evil. If we can do that, then we can enter eternal life. 
did we need another covenant? Wouldn't accepting and following Jeremiah's model have been enough? No, it was missing something. There are hints in Isaiah and Jeremiah of the need for and role of a, a suffering servant. As there was clearly seen to foretell the surprising role of service and suffering that we see in Jesus as the Messiah. It was that total involvement in the world, that acceptance of humanity and even mortality, which puts the seal on the new covenant. And it does so with love. Not a commanding or demanding love, but a love of total submission. Because through the resurrection, we have been given the power to be Christ-like ourselves. It has become something innate, something unlearnable and essential to our natures. So this new promise, realised in the crucifixion and resurrection, is the perfection of Jeremiah's covenant. It allows us to see through this physical world, but shouldn't diminish our gratitude for the grace that we've received. Like it or not, we're stuck here for the duration of our physical lives. And for many of us, it is an overwhelmingly enjoyable experience. It would be a hollow enjoyment if we didn't take awareness of the suffering around us. That gratitude is the inspiration to love and to serve, serve especially those less fortunate than ourselves. The promise is that loving service can transform us and our fellow creatures, and indeed, all creation. Amen. <laughs>